Welcome to The Engineering Room, a monthly uh, series of long-form conversations with influential people from the software world. The Engineering Room series is sponsored by Equal Experts, and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. So if you'd like some help building some great software or are interested in finding a great place to work, do check their links in the description below. My guest today is an engineering leader focusing on distributed low latency trading platforms. He and I share some background in this, including building fast financial exchanges and the trading systems that interact with them. Frank has spent over a decade playing the game of trade-offs necessary to create mission critical systems with sub millisecond response times. And he loves chatting about complexity and testing. So he and I are gonna get on pretty well, I think. Um, and also performance. He's also deep into the creation of reactive systems uh, described by the reactive manifesto that I helped to write. So I'm very clean to explore that with him too. Please meet Frank Yu. Thanks Dave for the intro and very excited to be here. Um, you know, reading continuous delivery was sort of a watershed moment in my career and it clicked into place so many things that have been swirling in our heads for years and um, excited to get get deep into any of these topics. That's great, that Frank, and it's, it, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to it now. We were chatting beforehand and I've, I've already got ideas spinning around my head from the conversation that we had beforehand. Really interesting. Let's start off. I, I, think, I think one of the interesting things about the sorts of systems that you work on and that I used to work on is that they're often kind of pushing at the edges of what's possible in some dimension. Um, and, and you were talking before about doing this in the cloud and, and, and so on. And I'm really intrigued to explore some of that. But in terms of the raw throughput and response time of computers, this is really, you know, leading edge stuff very often. It gets you into the guts of some pretty technical things. So how did you start off? What got you interested in this kind of game? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it is very much as simple as, you know, I took a performance programming course in college as an impressionable sophomore, uh, went to a career fair and uh, got roped into this wonderful world of exchanges. I, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, sort of run machines like they were sort of race cars and I was very interested in the inner workings of memory and building responsive systems. And so happened that an opportunity popped up uh, and promptly joined the team. And here I am decade, you know, decade and some odd later, it's, it, it's been quite a ride. It, it, it is indeed, and I I, 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 I like, we were talking before, and I, I like that analogy of of race cars. It's, you know, as we were discussing before, it's, it's kind of like the Formula One of computing, where it's not exactly the same as what regular car drivers see, but it kind of often influences things that come later, because it's, it's it's such a challenging domain, and I, and I think it's interesting from that point of view. I wondered if you could paint a picture of just how fast these sorts of systems are. Yeah, absolutely. I think in general, we um, you know our systems we provide uh, we provide a responsive system that will respond to requests sent to us. Um, packet comes in to us with the request. Packets got to come out, we would say, you know, in the P99.9s and under uh, a millisecond, I think. Um, and at least in our current uh, world in the cloud, this is now possible. And so we've done it. We, mm -hmm. uh, we provide clients with some expectation that they're going to get their um, feedback on what they've sent us almost instantly. So that's, that's really interesting, particularly you saying you, that, that you're being able to achieve these sorts of times in the clouds. Certainly in my time, we were talking about often dedicated, well, dedicated hardware, hardware co-locating um, mm -hmm. uh, trading systems uh, close to the exchange to limit speeds of light and so on. So how do you do this kind of thing? What are the challenges, I suppose, of doing this kind of thing in the cloud? Um, I think the big one is that uh, uh, largely, you know, in a previous life, that was the way we had built these systems, right? We had built systems that, yeah. you know, the server was next door from the clients that really cared, right? Mm -hmm. But I think 
um, what has actually happened is the uh, the advances in sort of networking technology over the past decade have actually made it so that um, you know networking speeds are quite high, and yeah. the 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 commodity cloud providers can get you fairly you know very good hardware, um, very close geographic location, um, you know in and it's now at everyone's fingertips. And so for us, right, we, um, when we built out uh, a new company trying to build an exchange from scratch, this now opened a lot of possibilities for us to be able to actually build one of these platforms in a short amount of time. And indeed that's the promise of the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. The, you, you trade off um, sort of, uh, stability of owning the the hardware you've got yourself for the ability to spin up anything at your fingertips in a uh you know an infrastructure as code manner you don't need to now provision teams of folks who've got lots of experience wiring uh wiring um ethernet and you know infiniband and solar flare cards together you 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 know a lot of this stuff is actually now out there for all of us to play with so yeah. this now democratizes access to capital markets in, in a way that I think is going to be a huge change in, um, in the future. I, I, I assume, though, that the, the nature of the, uh, that substrate that, that you're relying on in the cloud is kind of different to if you're buying a, a, a regular kind of you know, website that, you know, you, that's going to be sharp, you know, scaling through sharding and, uh, and you know denormalize the data and all of those sorts of things because a lot, a lot of those problems are are not really those those mechanisms aren't really open to you in the same way i assume so i think that um there's there's sort of some famous like um some famous uh numbers out there sort of the the 10 things uh 10 numbers every programmer should know and and there's a lot of actual great uh, public information out there about what the actual num latencies are between various things. And yeah. what you can do is you find yourself building from first principles, right? If I'm going, if I know that a write out to a managed database is X number of milliseconds, it, it, it makes the question very simple. You, you don't, you, you then will not use some of that stuff in the hot path if you want to provide low latency. But it, it actually is a great exercise in actually, um, you know, removing most of the, the tooling that you're maybe assuming you're bringing into any software endeavor, and you're actually picking and choosing. You're, you're going out to the store and picking the tools that you want to, to get what you need. And some things clearly um, don't apply right now for, for those timescales, but um, you have to keep things very simple. Um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, what we, what we've sort of commonly said is like simplicity is going to give you stability, uh, speed and development speed and, uh, sort of program speed. And so you're piecing together, um, small, com you're composing together little technologies and concepts and, um, and actually making very simple systems that you then productionize and harden, you know, using all of the principles that you've developed building sort of web scale systems in the cloud, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely a fun intellectual exercise here, but it is very much a back to basics thing. It's not quite yeah, I, so, I, I, in that there's respect, no arcane I, stuff. Yeah, and in that respect, I guess it's, it, it, it's really the same game it's just that somebody else is doing the provisioning of those environments for you and mm -hmm. uh, and so on but you're still looking to have those numbers in your head and figure out the optimizations and uh, and uh, you know your choices where you can afford to you know be a little bit slower for some for some value and we're, we're not I, I also i also i also really like the thing that you said which was definitely part of my mantra when when working on high performance systems is you know a high performance system is simpler than a conventional system than not more complicated because by definition we want to be able to do the most work with the with, with the least number of instructions kind of and so I, I often have this conversation with people that are striving to write 
you know, uh, improve the performance of their systems and saying you don't want to make it more more complicated. You want to make it simpler, nearly mm-hmm. always. And, and and certainly one of the things that we were doing with 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 uh, LMAX when we were built our exchange was was tuning things and to to to, to make sure that we're getting the most out of compilers and those sorts of technologies. So that, and that works better with simple code. So I'm pleased. I'm very pleased to hear you say you know reconfirming my my. Um, uh, 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 reconfirming my prejudices, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I think a big a big piece in sort of the software world is you know there's all all in sundry awesome great technologies that are all really fun and in, in, in indeed a lot of those technologies are near and dear to my heart. It's the way that they're implemented. It's all um, very it's all very interesting, and you want to sort of build up this huge tool chest of a lot of things, but I think when you're going at the edges, you've got to strip away most things and really focus on what is necessary. And yeah. so less is definitely more when it comes to ultra low latency, for sure. Yes. Remove yeah. as many things as you can. Yeah. And 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 the idea of kind of the time budget and having some some understanding of the cost of your choices. Uh, I, I I can remember you know, us discussing, you know, how many microseconds it took a packet to get from, from you know, the, the wire across the network card and into the stack and all of those sorts of things and, and working those things out. So at least we knew what the, the theoretical limits were that we had to play with it and, and, and what we knew what was at some model of what was possible. Mm-hmm. And even when you're a lot latency sensitive, there's sort of two axes here, right? There's sort of the the end-to-end latency of a system, but there's also yeah. sort of throughput. Uh, yes. And most, uh, I think, we all have to solve throughput problems, and it's a whole axis of optimizations and architectural trade-offs you can make. You know, latency is another axis, and you know it's fairly orthogonal sometimes. Sometimes maybe uh, I would say if we do a good job separating concerns. It's it's orthogonal to to throughput, but um, you know even in non sub millisecond worlds, latency is important. Uh, responsiveness is of UIs and you know how long a user needs to wait for things is a fundamental piece of you know people's experience, right? Like you know how much time do we spend waiting for web pages to load, and all of those considerations are fundamentally message workflows. This thing takes X long, it goes over here, what is the bottleneck? These concepts do apply back from you know, the folks pushing the boundary on this, but it, it flows back to the, the sort of um, work that we all do to make you know, users' lives better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's in, in the, in, while we were having a conversation before this we were we were kind of talking about what we talk about. One of the things that you said in, in in some of the information that you sent me that was, you know, many trading systems are fundamentally message driven due to latency sensitivity. You know, I often, I often hear people saying that they um, that haven't worked in high performance being suspicious of messaging in particular and asynchrony because they assume it's going to be slower. But can can you explain why um, the link between those ideas? Yeah, I, I think that um, s- distributed systems that um, are, I guess it's sort of more of a proof of contradiction per se. Like if we look at it the other way, I think um, if you have synchronous systems where, where you're calling A, A calls B, B calls C, and A needs to wait for C to get back to B and back to A, you've sort of built a software, you've sort of built a network stack of these processes where everyone's waiting on everyone else, Yeah. right? Um, so I think concept, conceptually, when we're able to stream requests in and not have to wait for any individual response to get back, you, the system is able to flow um, and be fluid like water. Requests can sort of flow through a system and the, the bottleneck is then the actual pipes and not 
the yeah. orchestration that, that the sort of the um, the 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 artificial orchestration and dependencies you've built in front of the logic. So synchronous distributed systems generally, I think you're adding a lot of complexity to own, to, yeah. to have that synchronous nature. And uh, yeah, I, I, exactly. I, I I would agree that that's been my experience too. So 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 I I often think about it. You know, in a synchronous system, you kind of as slow it's slow as the slowest part. In an asynchronous mm -hmm. system, you know, each part can be as fast as it needs it needs to be or is designed to be. Uh, and mm -hmm. and also, you, I think often in a synchronous system, you're actually doing more work to to maintain the the, the synchrony. Um, so so things like stopping a thread and waiting for you know waiting for it to wake up again you don't really need to do that in the same way if you've got an asynchronous system because everything's just responding to 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 the flow of events when they're coming through we're not you know we're not, we're not waiting for blocks and we're not we're not we're not reintegrating the data in the same way and, and so on if we do that in smart ways absolutely and fundamentally when you've chosen to make your system a distributed system which is a fault i mean most non-trivial systems are distributed systems, right? Yeah. You've now, um, you have to give up control to literally how the world works and how circumstance works when you're pushing something to a network. It may come, it may not. Um, the synchronous, asynchronous, when you are synchronous, um, you're trying to take that non-distributed world um, that is very simple and idealized and apply it to the very messy space that is the real world, which is fundamentally asynchronous. Yeah. Um, so naturally you're going to have strange things come up in your edge cases. I think it's easy to go zero to 80% when you're building a synchronous system, yeah. but uh, Asynchrony should make it easier for you to think about the cases that get you from eighty percent to hundred. Yes, that's that. That's interesting that you would use the word easier because because that that's one of the that's one of the things that I've kind of thought of as one of my my several heresies was that I I think asynchronous systems are easier. I I I, I think that certainly when you're talking about distributed systems, that's true. I think, that, but 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 we they often don't seem like that to people. And I've had, I've had debates with people, even people who are used to doing event-based systems and so on, and say, oh, no, it's still not easier. But I'm not quite sure that I buy that, but, but it seems easier to me. So I'm interested in, in exploring that. Do, do, do you think that they're easier overall, or is it that point of, you know, it's easier, it's easier up to the 80%, and then after that, it, you know, to do the synchronous thing, and then after that, it's, it's easier? Or, or is it... Um, it's easy just a matter of us acclimatizing to, to the complexity of doing asynchrony. I, I'm not quite sure I know anymore. Fair enough. I mean, I will say here that within a given system, right, um, you do pay when you go, um, let's, let's say not synchronous because asynchronous, yeah. a, uh, you know, let's, so, so when you, you go for a, a, a sort of a not synchronous world, life keeping determinism is a lot more difficult and fundamentally humans kind of have one thread of existence right like we we sort of view things kind of in that single thread nature so i would say indeed in a if i had a non distributed system if i had a single system um you want everything to be serialized and in one um in one sort of one line of history as it were because when you have to deal with all the possible uh interleavings of events um you know it's it's it is more difficult but the real world right is yeah. is is like that there's no way to um uh, simply hide all of that complexity without paying in a lot of other different areas. And so when you go from a, uh, dis uh, a single system to a distributed system, um, then fundamentally 
your your flows have to become not synchronous. Um, you know, yes. that's sort of that's my thought with it. But there is huge benefits to a very simple single threaded mode of execution. And mm -hmm. indeed, I think our services try to eschew concurrency within a localized system as much as possible. You, you sort of want things to be done in an atomic manner, uh, deterministically, and um, you know, without reordering, if you can. And, and, and I, I think that's where, as I perceive it, the cost of you know, the a, a synchronous distributed system comes in and is the killer really is that that's the, you know that's that's the huge cost because as soon as you've got more than one person using such a system then you've got to deal with the concurrency of that in some manner and with asynchronous systems that's a much much easier problem to solve it seems to me it, it, given, um, given the constraints that you put on it that you just described but you know, if you if we sort of put something down and say, is it easier or not? I mean, absolutely. If I build yeah. the entire distributed system, it's clearly easier to build a non-distribute. It, or rather, it is easier for me to build a non-distributed system than a distributed system, and it would be easier for me to build a non-distributed system as a single serialized thread of existence because that yeah. that is how I experience the world. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, this is a bit philosophical. It's prob probably not where we should be going in on, on, on a tech conversation. But I, I wonder whether that's a matter of um, the way in which we learn to write and think about systems or whether it's something fundamental to us. Because it doesn't surprise me that while I'm talking to you, you're thinking about other things. It doesn't surprise me that you know, while we're having this conversation, other things are going on in the world. So so we're kind of adapted to that and not at the same time. I, I take what you're mm -hmm. saying in terms of thinking about things more linearly. Um, but as, as you've pointed out several times, it is the nature of the world, but that's not the case. Think other stuff's going on all of the time. Absolutely. It's an interesting problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so, so the, we, we're we're kind of touching on the edges of reactive systems now, really. So, so I, I mentioned in the intro that I, I after working um, on the Almac system, I was I was um, called in to help write something called the the reactive manifesto, which talked about this style of systems that we were building that were based on asynchronous messaging, the, the kind of thing, and using that to an advantage. You had some really nice ways of calling out some of the the, the properties of systems like those, um, talking about the separation separation of accidental and essential complexity and those sorts of design level things. I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about your experience of applying those kinds of techniques to building the kinds of systems that you do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, the it's sort of similar to the, 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 the continuous delivery, but I think the, the reactive manifesto sort of clicks a lot of things into place, practices and considerations that seem um, sort of second nature to someone in sort of the high performance space, right? It's sort of, oh yeah, that makes sense. It like yeah. um, systems should be uh, responsive, right? Like absolutely systems should be elastic, systems should be resilient in the face of failure, right? Um, I think the, the pattern, uh, you know, I think that there have been a lot of words spilled on patterns to build chains and webs of reactive systems, message passing system and event based systems. You know, Tim, if you know, uh, sort of uh, C, uh, what is it? Um, CQRS, sort of event mm -hmm. sourcing. A lot of, I think this is sort of, this touches on something that when we're, the reason why you have all of these different patterns that have popped up and people are ascribing names to it is because it really gets at sort of some fundamental nature in building these distributed systems in production that, that actually sort of work, given the technology we've got right now, right? Yeah. And obviously all the, you know, I want to contextualize the fact that, look, right now, the thing, the technologies I know about make it's so that it makes sense for us to be using a state machine driven approach yeah. to reactive systems. Um, and 
diving deep into that, I think the thing that we sort of um, have built upon is this idea of when you have a series of events, right? Each, um, the sequence of s s all of those events change the state of the system as a whole, right? Like if somebody creates an account now in the system, there is an account, right? And yeah. if you've got, you know, a hundred folks creating accounts and then a, a bunch of other folks using their accounts to submit orders, right? You have fundamentally a lot of concurrency in the system and each change to that system, um, you want to make sense of it because yeah. there's like all of this stuff that is happening in the system and you can put it in sort of a ledger, but um, without, I think for us, the big key unlock was it's very nice if we can reason about what happened and if we can reproduce what happened later before. Because one of the issues with asynchrony is you lose a lot of determinism unless you're very uh, conscientious about what you do with it. So yeah. in, a, in a system where, where, um, where actions are non-deterministic, when we found issues with, uh, that, that came up like, you know, some little specific interleaving of things caused some strange behavior, it became very difficult for us to uh, reproduce those scenarios unless we enabled very, very fine grained tracing of everything that happened on every machine, which sometimes yeah. is cost prohibitive in terms of engineer effort or, uh, or actual cost, yes. right? So, so I think, um, you know, in our world, the biggest struggles with reactive systems and, and a, a distributed systems comprised of reactive systems and honestly synchronous systems as well is dealing yeah. with sort of non-determinism of events. Yeah. So for us, I think, and this is really, and there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of advances, like the, the state of the art has, has sort of marched forward here about the concept of replicated state machines. If we're able to take your set of inputs, assign some ordering, um, and that ordering could just be FIFO in the order in which you've received it. Yeah. Um, if your systems are deterministic, meaning they do the same thing when the same things get sent to them, it makes it trivial to then reproduce issues if you can now copy that series of requests. So yes. I think that for us, there's all in sundry like little considerations that pop in very tactical things like, oh, this buffer overflowed over here, or this mailbox, you know, overflowed here, the outbox overfilled or the inbox overflowed. But I think if we could distill something out from our many years of dealing with these systems is that whatever we can do to make systems more deterministic is, is probably a good you know, it's it's good to make trade-offs to to increase determinism in the system. Yes, yes, a hundred percent, and and certainly one of the journeys that we went down at LMAX when we were we were building our versions of systems like these was we started off building what we thought of it were determin deterministic systems, and then kept finding areas where where they weren't as deterministic as we liked. So ordering in hash tables and time as an event rather than Listening, literally looking at clocks and all of those sorts of things, so that we could just keep wrapping up deterministic. You call random. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in absolutely. Your code. There you go. That's not deterministic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so it was, so it's it's an interesting exploration, and, and that idea of determinism it gets us into these these other parties. Systems like those are so much more testable because we can just kind of set up the conditions, and we get the same same response every time. Yep, absolutely. And so for us, right, like. Um, we, uh, I think, um, so there have been a lot, there's been a lot of developments basically now available to the public in terms of libraries and stuff around things like consensus, um, yeah. because we are, especially in a cloud environment where more and more, um, kind of, uh, you know, the, the wool has, you know, the, the hood has been lifted from everybody. We know that our machines will fail. At any point in time, the network will will kind of blip how you know when you least want it to, and 
it's important to now have systems that are resilient to partitions, random crashes of hardware that you don't own. You haven't been managing that computer and keeping it in a nice, cool environment, and you haven't been babying it your, yourself, right? Um, what that means is you you now have systems where, okay, if I can no longer trust the specific machine I'm running on, well, I better run multiple machines and do some amount of um, redundancy in my logic, right? And yeah. to enable redundancy, um, these multiple machines have to do the exact same things or, you know, it's, just, it's the easiest thing to have them do the same things. And the yeah. easiest way to have them do the same things is to have their code be completely deterministic, have one source of truth for the ordering of events, replicate that ordering of events to the other members that are redundant and um, continue forward only when you have some uh, quorum of, of redundant actors. And I'm trying my best not to necessarily name drop any specific algorithms out there, but like fundamentally the idea is that you want more than one thing handling your mission critical stuff because that thing could fail. Right? Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of great tools out there that let us do this. And in the past in capital markets, this was so important that I think we used a super simple, and I'm okay talking about this one, sort of the primary secondary sequencer thing. You basically have one thing who's a, who's a leader, whose job is to figure out your ordering of events. It's going to copy everything to a backup and yeah. only process that message when the backup has handled it. It's yeah. great. Um, it's super simple. It, it works. A, a lot of financial transactions in the world are actually backed by this very simple architecture. Yeah. One thing we ran into with this is that this, it's very difficult to make this work for hot upgrades in a true 24 seven um, operation of things. Yeah. And so um, um, indeed, like, Luckily, there's like a lot of new algorithms out there that that we can make use of consensus algorithms that actually do more than this sort of this hand wavy primary secondary strategy, yeah. right? Um, because you know, I think naively, we would come up with like multiple folks simul. You know, there wasn't a lot of uh, actually. Elmax did so much to increase communication within the capital markets world. People working on financial systems. But you know, there wasn't a lot of communication across because everyone's very secretive back then. But yeah. folks were kind of spontaneously implementing the same sort of hand wavy primary secondary sequencer solution everywhere. Yeah. Right. And so um, you know, this is a space, a time where um, the folks who are pushing the boundaries on performance are actually coming back and seeing all there's a, so many great practices in sort of the web space and the cloud space yeah. because in the web and the cloud, you're fundamentally dealing with hardware that that may go away at any time. And so you can yeah. now bring a lot more rigor into capital markets from from the cloud space. And that's fantastic. And and and, and the reverse is these sorts of ideas that, that you're innovating in your kind of space can start leaking out and, uh, you know, changing the way that we do web, web scale computing, too. So I was talking to somebody recently who's working on a fantastic sounding open source project to build actor-based reactive style systems, build the infrastructure to, to do those sorts of things. So, so sort of stateful serverless for, for mm -hmm. the web. So it's not going to be high performance, but it's going to get a lot of these other valuable properties of separating accidental complexity from essential complexity and, and, mm -hmm. and getting more deterministic systems and making that available to build for people building web systems. So I'm very excited to look into that myself and, and to understand more about it. But but this yeah, sort of crossover great. I think is, is 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 interesting stuff and certainly something that, that really interests me and I, I think would be a would be a, a, a good step forward for on a web style computing. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you know for for us, we the things we do and the, the designs we make are very much even the design of the process and the, the the choosing of how you orchestrate things and how you're organizing the data. It's all highly manual right now. It's very. Yeah. Um, I'm deciding that okay, 
this set of events is here. It is being replicated in a cluster. Here is what comes out. Here is what comes in. And I think what happens when the community takes a hold of a concept is a lot of that becomes abstracted and automated, where now yes. I can spin up six of these things and I just know they're going to work. They have cons they're backed by consensus. Yeah. Um, and I would say that the thing we've done, um, at least recently, is go deeper with this strategy, which is yeah. um, take this the sequence of requests. As long as you have a deterministic transformation of your requests to outcoming events, then there's no reason to actually um, buffer and send out events and disseminate events everywhere. You can simply disseminate your single event log of everything, yeah. um, or your single request log. And yeah. so uh, one thing we're doing is actually taking sort of event sourcing and maybe actually turning it into something like command sourcing with uh, deterministic, deterministic execution. Right. That's really um, that's really interesting because because that's that's something that I think I've seen, but in a kind of non-formal, an informal way. So so in in the Almax infrastructure, the we kind of we kept the logs at certain points in the systems and allowed other parts of the conversation just to be replayed. Mm -hmm. So events would be generated in response to those things. I hadn't kind of formalized it in terms of thinking of those in terms of the requests or, or the commands that were being issued. But but fundamentally, that we saw the same thing, I think. It's an interesting. Absolutely. It, mm -hmm. And for us, it was very much a um, it was very much uh, uh, an economic reason why we actually went this way. Yeah. Um, one thing and uh, one thing about command sourcing and commands and events or requests and events, right? Like, please create an account for me. Please submit an order. Please cancel all of my orders. Those are three requests, yeah. right? Um, the first one does, let's say one thing of change. The second one does one thing of change. The third one, cancel everything. Just, just get rid of all of it, please. Um, it can cause N things of change. You can have... Um, events that come out of a system in response to a request, you sometimes it's it's difficult to know what the out, how much output and how much bandwidth a request is going to cause yeah. into your yeah. distributed system. So we were finding out that events tend to be bigger than requests because mm -hmm. fundamentally what a system does is it takes a request, contextualizes it with its existing state, combines the two, and out comes an event, yeah. right? Like, okay, um, buy a, uh, you know, buy, a, buy an apple. Well, the system needs to know what an apple is. The system needs to know that you can buy one. So the system already knows that. You've only sent in buy one apple, like three yeah. pieces of data. And out comes an event that says, Dave, which is now four, another piece of data. So that's four pieces. He buys an apple from Todd. So that's yeah. that's five pieces of data that's come out. So yeah. what is you know? I think um, this is a extension of basically um, consensus. If you have a deterministic system, you can have your consensus as your kernel, basically the initial cluster, your primary, secondary, whatever, at the at the middle. And if you've stamped that that log is very solid and replicated and you're you're willing to stand behind it, you can now pass that log everywhere and it'll actually be more less jittery. So we all talk about sort of P99 latency, but we yeah. never talk about what is your P99 network utilization. It's kind of this strange concept, but when we were dealing with sort of um, network egress costs and what happens when crazy events happen that might cause thousands of events that happen, how do we just make all of that network cost go away? And yeah. so we came up with the idea of taking this request log, passing it everywhere, right? Um, and using other systems to read from it.
right? Yes. Like that, that, that was, I think, uh, or we came up with the implementation of how to actually get that done and extend basically a consensus model. Cool. So, 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 so this is, I'm, 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 I'm quoting you back to yourself, but this is kind of moving from event sourcing to command or request sourcing rather than Correct. anything else, just to kind of put a label on that. And, 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 and presumably this, 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 this gets back to what you were talking about before, you know, fairly deeply in terms of this works when you've got these genuinely deterministic systems. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why this is so valuable. Absolutely. And when you've got this log now, if you want, if you want to look up, if you've got some weird behavior that you want to debug, copy the log and, the, and the, your snapshot, copy it to your laptop, run your exact same production data inside a debugger, yeah. right? Like, and, and you're, you're likely to be able to find what state your system is in at any point in time. And when you've got systems like these, again, quoting you back at yourself from some of the stuff that you, that, that when we were exchanging information, you said that complicated business log logic in one deterministic reactive system is fairly straightforward to test and run fast. Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly um, the when you now have everything that's deterministic and serialized, and this is where I don't I wouldn't call it synchronous because it's serialized, but in yeah. you know, when you're running in one one stream of yeah. consciousness or one thread, now you can pin that thread to a CPU and watch it go real quick. Um, yeah. And I think, and folks, uh, folks who are working on all sorts of systems will, will note that actually my business logic is reasonably quick. It's the persistence in the, the IO and saving to disk that is slow or <laughs> fetch going out to memory or going out to cache, going out somewhere else and getting data is slow, but my yeah. logic is reasonably quick. Or so even, or even dealing with it with, with concurrency. It's, it's, it's one of the things that drove the architectural decisions that we made when we were building our exchange was that at one point we built a, a, a staged event driven architecture and we, we measured it and saw that we were spending several orders of magnitude more time determining which thread to do to execute things on than we were actually <laughs> spending executing them at which point we threw it away and started again. Yes. <laughs> Try to avoid concurrency inside a system as much as possible these days. I mean, not yeah. to say that processor architectures don't change in the features and context switching becomes memory bandwidth skyrockets or whatnot. But certainly yeah. now, my single threaded pin state machine will probably run quicker than, you know, 48 cores doing concurrent logic for sure. Yeah. So, so, it's, so, so it's, it's only when you've got those 50, 50, an algorithm that requires to allows you to do 50 things in parallel without joining them together again that you're going to benefit. <laughs> Absolutely. And to be fair, um, you know, ch changes in the world are being brought on by massive uh, same instruction, multiple data, SIMD, right? Like, like yeah. GPUs now being able to figure out how to change all your algorithms to make them run through GPUs really well yeah. is something that is changing the world, right? Absolutely. And so, if you're so, able to do that, then that's great. Absolutely. There's different kinds of algorithms. So, yes. so it's just that the, the ones that are parallelizable to really get those performance gains are relatively unusual. You, and it's, it's hard to just, it's, but when, but when they are, that, that's, that's the best way to go. But it's, it, it's, mm -hmm. I guess, back to what we used to talk about as mechanical sympathy of just understanding what the hardware can do for you and understanding how to make, how to make use of it. Absolutely. So, the, um, so, so the, the, um, this idea of um, going back to this idea of complex business logic, one of the other things that you said was uh, let me just find that um, the most accessible ways for a restless junior en engineer to make an impact um, and learn the system deeply is to build significant testing frameworks. So that plays into the, these complex logic and then evaluating those and helping us to build these more deterministic systems, perhaps. Absolutely. I mean, I think when when a system is very complex and you're able to have um, folks come in 
and build um, frameworks that interact with uh, interact with these systems, not in production, but in a dev, a sanitized environment, you can play. Like fundamentally, yeah. we should be thinking about testing as playing with your logic, right? Um, and th that's the best way we learn um, at you know growing up as 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 kiddos. Um, but also, when learning a new system, uh, a system that has easy um, access to add test coverage and um, also has obvious avenues where you can create entire classes of coverage, I think are great, um, great opportunities for any new, whether they're ju junior or sen senior engineer on a team to, to onboard and really, you know, uh, make a huge impact. Because mm -hmm. when you've got, uh, you know, systems that you've got to support in production, anything you can do to improve uh, stability has zero downs, you know, has limited downside risk and will make the lives of everyone on the team better, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a great way for folks to immediately come in and make an impact. And it requires some deep understanding of the flows because you can't play with something unless you're going, um, it's hard to, um, while you're playing with something, you're gonna be creative with it. Like fundamentally it's about you know, acts, you know, getting your brain juices flowing and, uh, and playing with that system. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I find that in my career, uh, certainly in our space where things are very mission critical and, you know, a, uh, an error, um, can cause dramatic consequences, not only for ourselves, but for, um, unrelated customers or folks who are, you know, a lot of our customers might be caught in the blast zones of various bugs. Um, yeah. You know, this, this is a, a place where a, the testability of the system is very important. And when you've got that, then folks can come in, build coverage, design new systems, build, you know, have fun with, you know, do some astronaut architecture on new test frameworks. It's, it's quite interesting, even if, that stuff does not have to occupy production hardware, right? Yeah. So and, 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 and make change with with so much more confidence because of the determinism of the system. Absolutely. Um, one thing we find, and this is where sort of um, actually the this the the not synchronous versus synchronous thing comes into play. Coming back into that, um, I believe that tests largely tests that test functionality should be synchronous. They should be at least yeah. serialized and threaded. You should not have a lot of non-deterministic event handling in yeah. your test specification um, because now you've, you've conflated the concerns of dealing with the interleaving of communication with the actual business domain events that are happening in your system. So yes. that's an area yeah. where, you know, doing synchronous calls or turning asynchronous responses into synchronous calls, I think is quite, quite valuable. You actually go the other way with tests, yes. right? Um, and so hence my, my sort of love hate with a, a, not asynchrony and synchrony, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, I think a, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a relationship that's complicated. There's sometimes where it's great and sometimes where it's kind of not great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that, 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 I, I, understand, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's um, the, the thing with testing, I, I hadn't thought of it exactly that way around before, but it's, it's, an, it's an interesting perspective in that, you know, you're trying to build these systems, distributed systems that are more deterministic and asynchronous and then when we're testing them we don't want that we want them to be we want them to tell us now is it working or not <laughs> absolutely we want the answer in the test yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think one thing you can do right when you've decoupled the execution of your test with the specification of the business uh yeah. functionality um is that you actually can write tests that test multiple layers of your system. So yeah. the same test, 
Um, here, I'll, I'll give a very specific example. Like our mission critical logic is sitting in say our, our monolith, right? And um, that monolith has a sequenced request log or, or whatever, that, that's all great. I can write a test that um, talks about the various business things I'm doing implements the monoliths API as all the clients in the world and tests the monolith that way. I think that's yeah. kind of what your normal um, sort of black box testing would be. Mm -hmm. When I now want to test my distributed system uh, in production, I don't simply have a monolith that's housing all my logic naked open to the internet. I have a gateway layer of, I have a layer of, services that might handle client communication or internet communication, um, yeah. whether that's HTTP servers, load balancers, or whatever, right? Once I've added that layer, my same test case, my, my same test case, you know, create an account, buy an Apple, eat the Apple, recycle the core or something like that, uh, recycle yeah. the container yeah. or whatnot, that, that test case does not change. But the implementation then goes from maybe executing message passing to the monolith yeah. and becomes executing HTTP calls, sending messages over some, you know, enterprise bus, doing something else to talk and talk to the system. Yeah. But your one yeah. test case now tests all the all of the functionality of your, your inner core logic and your um, communication layer which yes. all of it needs to be fairly well tested, right? Yeah. And then finally, I, I, there's nothing stopping you from running it against a deployed stack, that same test case. Yeah, exactly. And, and we saw exactly the same thing with our system and, and, and did the same thing. So, so you end up with these more abstract acceptance tests that evaluate from the perspective of, from the business perspective, really. And, and, and that's another one of the, the values of this, separation of the essential and ex accidental complexities of the system. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you find that the implementation, the guts and the bits parts of some of these, you know, how do you turn something very abstract into something very concrete yeah. that the implementation of that framework ends up being sort of a fun engineering challenge. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can, you can get into, why don't I, checksum the state of all of my services for every message that comes in. Why not, right, on yeah. my tests, right? You can do quite some amazing things with um, even a live persistent layer on, you know, underneath your, your, uh, your test cases. It's, um, yeah. you know, and that's, that's important, I think. Well, one, one, of the thing, one of the things that we, that we did sort of late in my time at LMAX was that we had a, a fairly large suite of different trading tests or acceptance tests that we're testing through the whole system. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to run some faster cycles against our matching engine. So we just kind of removed the protocol drivers that translated the interactions mm -hmm. underneath our test cases. Without changing any of the test cases, we could run probably hundreds of thousands, probably possibly more test cases in, in, in a few seconds against mm -hmm. our matching engine and get feedback on all of the behaviors of our system if we wanted to. It was just, it was just really powerful. Absolutely. And if you wanted to simulate a hot, hot deploy, you could write a harness that for every request that comes into system, crash the system and have it come back from yeah. persistence. Yes. And, and, and I, I think one of the things well, when we were talking, this was going through my head when we were talking about the determinism of the of the system and the log and all of those sorts of things. One of the things that I think that people often miss with these sorts of systems is that, or, or at least the counter example of systems that aren't like these, is the lossiness. So often, you know, if if you're talking about writing, you know, right, building a system and writing some stuff to a database, and then you close the system down, you've lost the story of how all of that data got there. And so unless you built that into the application to kind of capture some sort of time series of the history of change, that's all gone. Whereas with these sorts of systems, it's a lossless system. We keep the log of changes, the commands and requests that come in. All of the information is there so that we, so that, you know, we can recreate that picture in whatever form that we want. And it's going to be correct. 
it's going to be reproducible from scratch if that if we have the log all of the way Yes, I think this is one of the one of the key differentiators between, say, a command source or request source system versus an event source system. Yeah. So I'll give you an event source system that's used by like billions and billions of folks all around the world, and that's if you take the Postgres write ahead log or any database's write ahead log, there's your events. That's the yeah. full. Um, set of changes that come out of the system after you execute some query, right? Yeah. And now presume you built an application that streamed the wall, right? The write ahead log. And I just looked at all the changes and change data capture, you do this. But how do I, how do I predict what the throughput of that? What if someone goes in and says, delete from, delete from orders, period. Mm -hmm. That one command is going to come in and then spit out possibly hundreds of thousands of write ahead log entries and explode yeah. your system when all, all someone did was maybe fat thing, you know, accidentally typed drop, drop table or do whatever. Right. right. So the difference is instead of, so with event sourcing, you're kind of reading the changes after they've happened and you can't reject, by the way, you can't reject a write ahead log event. You can't reject yeah. an event. You can't say, no, I don't like that this event happened. What you can do with requests is you can say, no, I don't like this request. I don't want to deal with this right now. You can validate requests. It is difficult to validate events. So yes. if instead of having your system simply stream the write ahead log, if your system was able to very quickly replay the sequence of SQL requests, now, now Postgres may not be tuned for something like this, but if you actually had the exact ordering of SQL requests with no concurrency, then I could replay the state of any given database at any point in time. Yeah. And if I have a logic error, I'd be able to reproduce it. So that's kind of a sort of a relational look into some of the systems that we're running, right? We, we have the ability yeah. to take our sequences of queries to our persistence infrastructure and pull it out, inspect it, rerun it in our on our laptops with more debugging lines attached, rerun it here, rerun it there, try yeah. it on different hardware, do whatever we want, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, incredibly powerful and is, I believe, one, th that's, I think, one way where I think pushing reactive systems a little more, like really just driving, um, relying on deterministic execution to do more for us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and certainly there were cases um, in our use of it where where we, we literally took logs from production and replayed the sequence of events to be able to debug a problem, you know, yep. um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and got exactly this. You know, we got the exchange into precisely the same state it was in, uh, in production when things went wrong. Um, so that, that, that's a very, very powerful, powerful idea Absolutely. and it and all back to, down to this lossless communication and determinism in the system mm -hmm. absolutely yep so what one, one of so, so so one of the things that you also said was about decoupling code changes from behavior changes um as as part of this which which which, which is a lot about what what this does really because we're we, we're kind of essentially recording the instructions, the, the conversation, I suppose, mm -hmm. at some level. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that allows us to do this kind of decoupling. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're running in a system like this, where you're saying, I have such confidence in the, the, the fact that my code is deterministic, I can now replicate compute instead yeah. of just replicating data. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a spectrum. You can you can go really deep into replicating compute where I just rerun my core logic everywhere, literally everywhere. Yeah. Or maybe you do some buffering, you know, at, at some midpoint or some shared nodes. But if you're replicating compute, then compute has to actually replicate. It's gotta stay the same. So yeah. We talk about append-only data, right? And that's great. You can't modify data that came before and all that. It always looks the same when you read it from message zero to 10, right? Um, with your code, as the one constant about code is that it is changing, right? The, the whole point of continuous delivery and just 
adding new features is we're constantly changing the behavior of our systems. Yes. And that said, as you change the behavior of the system um, and that code is reading requests from the past, your new code must do the exact same thing as the code in the past. So yes. I think this is probably the, the area where you need to apply the most craft in kind of relying on deterministic execution, which is making sure the system's actually deterministic in the face of your code changes. But what we, what we do is, okay, if I have changed a bit of code, um, even if I've deployed it, I've flagged that, uh, that change in behavior behind a flag, basically. Yes. And that flag is not set by a configuration file read on the server. That config flag is passed directly into the request log through your, your admin interface. So yeah. when I do a deploy, I expect nothing to change at all in the behavior of my system. And one thing that that, now, how do you test this? We can talk about that um, you know, a little later, but what it gives me is if I am confident that when I change code, nothing actually changes for customers, mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm able to change code whenever I want, deploy it whenever I want, assuming that my failovers, I think in a non 24 seven world, uh, you can do that because there's downtime, but in a 24 seven world, you have to think about, um, customer, you know, your, the cost of deployment is impacts to customers, uh, via failover. But in general, that is kind of the essence of something like a continuous delivery where you're actually, as soon as your code gets in, if if you're confident it doesn't break stuff, push it in and push it all the way out to prod. You've got one branch, one trunk, and it's yeah. you get rapid feedback as soon as you turn the flag on. Let's talk a little bit about that 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 twenty four seven thing because because that that's certainly challenging. It, it was one of the it was one of the problems that that we never tackled at LMAX. And, and I was always interested in doing so because I, I was in, because it's a hard problem. So how do you cope with the balance that the competing tensions between these very high performance, very low latency systems and 24 seven operation. You know, my answer will is more that this is fairly circumstantial. It's that now the technology exists where we can do these. So um, now the technology exists where failovers from a leader to a follower can happen on the order of, you know, milliseconds or seconds at the most. And if your service interruption is indeed that limited, you can do some tactical things like buffering the, st like keeping track of some requests that you absolutely should deliver and, you know, dropping the stuff that maybe is more transient in nature. Um, and that does require um, you know, an engineer, an architect to, to know, um, um, and then, you know, uh, someone designing a, a solution to know about the domain and understand where slack can happen in the system. Um, mm -hmm. obviously whatever affordances we are able to, able to, able to justify, we take. So now that it is possible to have a system that can fail over in a short amount of time like that, you can preserve service with no interruption while upgrading the state, your state machine in a rolling manner to all of your followers first roll the leader, no behavior changes because your system is deterministic. Once you're confident that all your code has been rolled out, then enable the behavior change and that behavior change actually gets turned on for customers in the span of a mic you know a few microseconds right so so i think if we're able to decouple code delivery with code behavior as it mm -hmm. is live in production it makes it it is one thing you absolutely need to do this 24 7 command source system um but uh in a now that said in an event source system you can just do partial deploys of various services and the 
as long as you record the events that go out to say a message bus or everybody's favorite message bus, then it'll, it'll more or less work. Um, yeah. So we have a few more considerations, but we feel that when, um, you know, we feel that if we're, if we're confident that, you know, your code changes don't impact the behavior of the system, then it allows us to be a lot, lot more agile in deploying stuff and merging things to, to try. I don't know whether this is too big a topic to start because we're kind of starting to get close to time. But but I, but the the other complexity with systems like these usually is is um, how do you deal with um, changes in the structure of messages as as over time as you learn new things and the messages might you might want to change them. How do you cope with those sorts of things or changing in the logic in the way that it handles the messages, you know, to, to be able to deal with, you know, those sorts of. Um, yeah, points. absolutely. So what we're talking about is sort of a, how does our API evolve and new fields come into the system without necessarily breaking backwards compatibility or, yeah. or and not even. I think our form of backwards compatibility is a lot more strict in that it has to be exactly the same, not simply, yeah. um, it has to be exactly the same and not simply it should still work maybe in a degraded fashion, right? And so the way we think about it is the pattern of append-only data is, is pretty, pretty sort of pretty sort of reasonable, right? Like, you know, code uh, or, you know, data, you only do inserts, you don't do updates, you don't delete the stuff except maybe at the top, which is important mm -hmm. when we talk about printing. But with code, code is data, right? Like that's that's the thing, that's sort of the big, um, uh, that's the big insight that, you know, we, we learn in school or whatnot, that code is data as well. Um, you can have append-only code, right? Mm -hmm. You can keep code that does the exact same thing as before, given some state of the system. So if I have a sequence of, <clears throat> um, of changes to the behavior all flagged by even a Boolean, it's like, okay. Um, uh, and the extreme example is this. Let's say there was a bug that say didn't crash the system, but it didn't do what I wanted, right? Um, I go and make a fix um, to the bug and I flag my fix behind with the flag bug fix one, right? After I deploy it to the system, when that system is replaying logs from before I enabled the flag, it better do the buggy behavior because you can't, you don't change history, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, otherwise that's like saying, you know, uh, that's like breaking TCP or something like that, if you, yeah. if you do that. So any new change to a message, any, anything like that, the handling of that data is actually flagged behind a, conf a, a, a behavior flag that says, all right, before this flag is on and I receive a message with a new field, I, that field is invisible to me. I'm going to do exactly as I, exactly the same thing I did before the yeah. flag was added. And when I add a new message, a completely new message, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore that message completely if I don't understand it or do the default, I don't understand the message error. Yeah. Right. So until the, until I say, all right, let's handle the message and send it through our system. We're not handling any new messages. So this way we can change our API however we want without impacting behavior. Right. Yeah, that's, and, yeah. and this is, this is absolutely needed to avoid a situation where some of your downstream code base is running newer code and doing different things than the older bit of code. Um, yeah. So uh, this, I think, is an area of our own, you know, I wouldn't say, I don't, I wouldn't say that we're doing research on it in so far as we're dogfooding it. Like, I think there are patterns that are going to have to come out of this, yeah. this sort of behavior management in a in replicated state machines that we'll figure out patterns for and then we'll be able to give names for practices that we've done but um but now it is very much we do this because of first principles we have to maintain deterministic execution and and that uh, ju just just to call this out explicitly so it's it, 
it 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 it's it's plain yeah, that's so important on on you know, sending the flag through the message the, the sequence messaging system so that Absolutely. it happens at the same time and he's and he's able to determine those things so you know before that sequence of a message you could you could have the old version of the message and then afterwards you, you have a new version of the message that the code that's switched by the flag can now process mm -hmm. and even i mean nothing is stopping a client from sending a new version of the message the well you could validate at mm. the front yeah but if you don't validate, you should accept that new messages could show up in your log and you've got to ignore them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you said during the conversation there was something that there was something that you wanted to mention about testing in terms of in terms of the, the flags. Absolutely. So this is actually something, um, you know, I, I follow the engineering room a lot. It's it's a great channel. Uh, but um, I noticed um, and the the CD channel, there was a there was a thing about approval testing. Yeah. Which is that you take existing, from what I understand, and you can you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but you take sort of a set of logs and you kind of verify that sort of nothing changed after you run your new bit of code on it, right? Yeah. This is absolutely, this is this sort of thing, now we've put a name to it. So thanks for telling us the name of what this is. We've called it Sentinel, deployment Sentinels or whatever. Like absolutely, yeah. I need to take a checksum of all the output of my system give of my system with new code given old yeah. logs and it better be exactly the same as my old system given those same old logs yeah. right so it is you know that is how you make sure that changes don't change anything you have to test that changes don't change anything yeah that's that, that's 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 a nice idea uh, and uh, is is that is that built in as part of your deployment pipeline? Are you, are you doing that on, on, on every change? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, and I think you, there's lots of fun things you can do with this with sort of speculative changes. I mean, clearly if we're replaying old blocks, it won't include new information. So yeah. there's still, again, this is an area of active research or something. Like there's, there's, more, there's more we can do with this in this space and hopefully we can distill it down into some bullet points, but um, just having confidence that at least we won't um, do the wrong thing on our existing production and all of our dev logs is is yeah. important. Well, Frank, I, 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 I've used enough of your time. I, I'd like to thank you for, for a fascinating conversation. And it's really interesting. I, I, I find it particularly interesting to see the way that, that you, you're kind of taking forward some of the ideas that that, 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 that we came up with and, and doing more with them. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, uh, really, really innovative stuff there, it, it, it sounds like to me. Um, thank you again. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Uh, to, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the content today and, and, and Frank's really fascinating descriptions of, you know, cutting edge reactive systems um, and high performance systems. And if you enjoyed the content today, hit subscribe. And if you really enjoyed it, hit like as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave.